session. We have a special guest, Corey Quinn, um, the man behind marketing <laughs> at Scorpion when they grew yeah. the, the business. I think one of the one of the largest agencies in the digital marketing space from 20 yeah. million to over 120 million. Um, just a wealth of knowledge in terms of how to position in a vertical, how to grow an agency, how to build an outbound sales process and not be completely reliant on inbound. Um, he's got some great content. He's got a new book coming out, uh, but I'm really excited to have Corey with us. Um, you know, it's very rare you can talk to somebody at this level that has this level of ex expertise uh, and kind of pick their brain. It's like, see what worked and what's working right now. So Corey, thank you so much for being with us today. Josh, it's a true honor. I'm super excited for our conversation. So let's let's start, and I'd love to start with, you know, how how did you get started at at, at Scorpion, and kind of sure. what was the what was the journey, you know, from 20 million to you know 120 plus. <clears throat> Sure. So I started, I was hired as Scorpion's first chief marketing officer in 2015. And previous to this role, uh, the founder and uh, CEO of the company, Rustin Kretz, he, he was effectively the head of marketing in addition to running all other aspects of the business. And so I was really the first strategic hire to exclusively focus on growing the agency from a sales and marketing perspective. And when I joined, I, uh, I inherited a six person sales team and this six person sales team the, gosh, they were, uh, they were very, uh, great guys. They were very well paid. They, uh, they drove nice cars, had a great life. And that was primarily because they had, um, they had really, uh, Scorpion by that time had really built a name for itself with attorneys and, and, mm. and personal injury attorneys specifically. And as a result of this, brand recognition in the in the uh, in the market they had this wonderful flow of inbound leads uh, and as a result of that uh, they would often do these one call closes they had this big metallic gong on the sales floor uh, and it would be like this big kind of uh, you know this this really great culture the challenge was at the time that the founder was really eager to grow the business beyond that 20 million mark. And so I was brought in as well as Jamie Adams, a couple other folks to really help us to grow from that focus in attorney marketing and $20 million uh, all the way up to, as you mentioned, 120, we made it actually all the way up to $150 million. Uh, just a little bit about my the, the growth while I was there, I started in 2015. And uh, at the time there were six salespeople by the time I left at the end of 2021, there were a hundred salespeople. Wow. <laughs> by the, uh, by I, when I joined, there was a hundred employees. By the time I left, there was a thousand employees and we had a thousand clients when I started and 14,000 clients by the time that I left. Massive, massive yeah. growth. Amazing what you guys accomplished there. Mm. Um, when you, when you think about like some of the key shifts that you guys made, that really yeah. helped to propel the growth. Um, yeah. like, like what were some of the key you know, salient points in your mind? Sure. I would say the first one was we, as I mentioned, we had this great inbound machine going based mostly on the fact that, you know, Scorpion had all these attorney websites that were out there. They were early in the sort of the website design and SEO space. And so there's a lot of really great inbound from that. However, you can't really control the flow of inbounds when it comes to uh, when it comes to, to sales marketing. So the first thing we did is we brought in a outbound sales motion, right? And I could talk about a lot of the specifics there, but what that allowed us to do was complement all of the sales that we were generating already from inbounds and add to those with outbound driven sales. And that alone, Josh, that actually doubled our business from 20 million to 40 million wow. just by bringing in outbound. The other thing we did was we took what we really uh, did well in attorney marketing and we actually went to another vertical, which at the time was home services, HVAC and plumbers. And I know that uh, you and I, uh, you know, we both uh, serve the same market in that regard. And so that was an additional sort of vertical that we approached. There's some things that we did really well, I think, as it relates to how to grow the business into a new vertical. Uh, and then the third one that I'd, I'd like to share, uh, sort of big kind of win for us or milestone 10x moment was when we went from serving single location local service businesses like attorneys and HVAC and plumbers and whatnot into serving multi-location businesses. 
And it was, it was really just sort of a natural extension where you work with a franchise business uh, that has 100 locations. And each of those locations are effectively a small local service business. And so that, that uh, working with those multi-location businesses helped us to scale up the revenue uh, quite dramatically. So good. And I remember because, you know, you guys started in, in legal, right? And I know yes. a lot of people think Scorpion's this massive multi-vertical yeah. business. Even when I said I was interviewing you, like, you only talk about niche stuff. Why are you bringing in a general? So I was like, not the case. <laughs> Scorpion was the legal marketing agency, mm. right? And I remember yes. studying you guys' websites and how you structured things back in the day. Like, just really, really top class in terms of mm. your deliverables. Um, and then you made this, this strategic decision to expand into other verticals. But Correct. it wasn't like this hop into, let's serve everybody. Like you guys strategically right. chose home services, and I'm sure a couple others, and went after it in a really big way. Like, and not just, you know, outreach, but you were at the events and you were buying these big booth spaces and really got Correct. aggressive to make an impact in that industry. Correct. And that, and that is a big sort of takeaway that, that I carry forward now, having left Scorpion, is that a real, really today, a lot of uh, a lot of people think, well, I'm going to niche into an agency, and well, that means I have to have a landing page, and I have to have, you know, a you know, maybe I'll go to a conference once in a while. And really, what we found a real recipe of success was really leaning into not only you know the you know targeting these businesses, but also finding a way to build relationship, genuine relationships in those industries, um, and really join them from a from an empathetic or you know from a care perspective. We really cared about not only the clients that we serve, but also uh, the industry. And so that that I think helped us to stand apart because we were so committed and so uh, present inside of that vertical market. I'd love to have you talk a little bit more about that. I know you published an article in Forbes on this, yeah. like kind of the importance of empathy and niche selection. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just, let's choose yeah. a random niche and, and go all in. Like talk a little bit about your philosophy, you know, behind this, this whole empathy. Sure, absolutely. So I think in when, when you're choosing a vertical market, you need three things. Number one, you need a number one to focus, right? You need to find a, a vertical market that has that's large enough, that has enough demand, enough spend in it for you to, for it to make sense for your business. Number two is you need a strategy. You need a massive action plan that will help you to create a distinctive competency and, and competitive sort of moat in that, in that vertical. So you need a great plan. And the third thing, which I've found is a little bit maybe unique or not talked about as much is what you need is empathy. You really need to care about not only the clients you're serving, but the industry that you are, uh, that, that you're serving. And so I think uh, I'd love to give the example. I think you you may know uh, this gentleman, Luke Eggerbrotten. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. So so I think he's part of your community. And mm -hmm. the thing that I love about Luke is that he is he. So he has a an agency called Phaser Marketing, and Phaser focuses on working with the businesses in the construction industry. And what's interesting about how Josh, sorry, how how uh, Luke is doing this, is how he's going to market is he has not only focused on these construction businesses, but he has done things like um, started a nonprofit and also provides scholarships to help raise the awareness uh, and the profile of working in the blue collar trades. You see, there's a big challenge right now in the, in the trades where a lot, of, a lot of people who work in that industry are, are, are aging out, they're retiring, and there's just not enough supply and so I think what is, again, interesting about uh, what Luke is doing is he is really not only when you work with him as an agency partner, you're not only working with you know, someone who will help you get leads, but someone who's really helping to raise the awareness and the profile of working in the trades. And so that's, that's a really interesting uh, way to approach you know, empathy and care, I think. I love that. I think, yeah, not just surface level saying, hey, this is a vertical. They've got a certain revenue threshold, an average transaction that makes financial sense. They're spending money on marketing, which you usually think yeah. about when you choose a niche, but actually caring about that industry and going, you know, if you're going to get involved in the associations and the groups, you know, caring about yeah. the industry as a whole. And I think it's, it's a really right. important point. Yeah. And, and when, you, when you think about it from the buyer's perspective, there's effectively an unlimited number of agencies who would love to work with construction businesses. Right. It's those those agencies who have uh, really committed themselves to the vertical and, and are doing things beyond just talking about it. They're actually doing amazing things to help support the vertical. That's when you really begin to stand out and differentiate. Yeah. And Luke's an amazing example of that. Look him up. 
uh, Phaser Marketing, mm. guys. He's, uh, he's doing great on this, on this front. So, so let's talk a little bit, and I really want to get into the outbound sales team stuff, but let's just yep. talk a little bit about you know, how and why you guys made the pivot from just legal into yes. other verticals. So at the time, we were um, led by our founder who has this sort of aggressive appetite for helping more and more people. I think we, we had built in legal was, was, was really working. We built a great engine. We had the inbound. We had the outbound. We were doing the conferences and the associations. And so what... We had a great sort of trajectory there and a lot of momentum, but we also saw an opportunity to expand into a new market. And the thing that really helped us to, to determine home services as the next area of focus is that they, uh, that they are local service. So if you think about an attorney, it's a local service business that is interested in driving cases from around a specific you know, office or you know, a, a specific geography. Mm -hmm. um, and the same is true for a plumber, right? They also are local business and, and they only want to attract jobs in the, in the local area. And so there was a lot of, a lot of similarities in that respect. And, and the, you know, I have to mention that there was also a lot of spend, right? So the way that Scorpion made money uh, was not only in providing websites and local SEO, but it also in PPC. And, and so we were also prioritizing those verticals that had a tremendous amount of spend potential. Uh, and so for us, it was an obvious choice. Uh, we also had a couple of home services clients already, sort of organically, they would come in through relationships and whatnot. So we had some track record to understand, you know, hey, we, we could see us really leaning into this vertical, the metrics look good. We, we actually have uh, one of the one of the top sales guys, his dad was a was a, uh, a roofer, and we had him as a client. So we, we really had a good sense that, hey, if we, we focus our energy here, we could really build this out as a new or a vertical for Scorpion. Very cool. And I, I think it's important for our viewers and listeners to, mm. to recognize Scorpion was at 20 million plus before they decided they were going to conquer a bunch of other verticals. Um, <laughs> yeah. I personally, I'd love to know your opinion. I think it's a mistake if you've gone to a million or two million or even five million, mm. you think we've got to go like conquer more verticals. And when you enter a new vertical, there's all kinds of additional complexity. Um, we'd we'll yes. love to know your thoughts on that. Yeah. So the way I think about it, Josh, is that um, I look at it at the percent of, of the market share. So mm. I use the I use the, the number three percent. Once you've built up your agency and you own three percent of the market, meaning let's say out of a out of a, a thousand attorneys in the market, you're working with 30 of them. That to me is an indication that, hey, I could lift my head up and maybe start building a new vertical. I have a lot of momentum here in this existing thing. What we learned when we were doing home services after doing attorneys for so long is that while they are local service businesses, they're not the same beast, if you will, right? Sure. They have different preferences. For instance, the story I like to tell is the way that we would send our clients leads is we would, we would um, uh, filter out all of the sort of spammy calls and all of, all of the things, all sort of the noise that our attorney clients did not want to deal with. What we learned on the home services side is that while they appreciated only getting high quality leads, they also liked hearing the phone ring, right? They liked the buzz. Well, it was a the, little more important there, right? They, they liked right. the- Yeah. <laughs> and that was sort of the antithesis of what we believed that uh, they, would, they would prefer based again on our experience with attorneys. And so there was some learnings in that regard on how to approach, how to adjust what we were doing for attorneys for, for home services. And there's one other thing I will, I'll share, Josh, is that we actually didn't have a huge home run in home services until we made one change. Mm. Um, and that was on our sales team, which was primary, which was all legally focused. We actually started having some of the sellers kind of focus on home services and, and didn't have a complete focus on that. We changed that and at a certain point. We brought in one of our sellers. His name is Travis Carter. He, he was a great sales guy, always kind of the middle, middle of the, uh, middle of the rankings, if you will, you know, on the sales, so the sales floor, always the middle, middle of the rankings, great guy, really, you know, wonderful personality. We actually moved him over to, over to home services. And the thing that really was the big difference is that he used to own a home service business. Mm. And as a result of that, he was able to create a lot more comfort and rapport very early on in the sales conversation. Cause he could say, Hey, I'm also a home services business owner. I know what it's like to be on the call with someone like Scorpion. And just that subtle, that subtle shift really helped us to learn that the, 
the benefit of really being an insider to their world really helps to improve the, the sales experience and remove friction from that buying process. That's a powerful insight. I, I appreciate you mm. sharing that. Um, so back to the, back to the question, yeah. 3% kind of is, if you don't have 3% market share, keep your blinders on, stay in Correct. that vertical at about 3% probably is the time to say, Hey, look, we've, we've gone as far as we can go here. We can keep running this niche, but it might be time Correct. For a second. That's right. That's right. And, and um, not to stop what you're doing in the original vertical, right. but to let that momentum continue to build. And then you take incremental resources, new resources to build the new vertical. You're not borrowing from the existing when you're using new, new resources. Love that. And in, in most verticals for, for all of you guys watching, that's going to mm. be north of at least 5 million, I would say. So don't feel like you need to tackle five, six, seven different verticals. You can build a 10 to $20 million agency in most of the verticals that you might specialize in. Correct, correct. I mean, a good example is plumbers. There are enough plumbers in the US today that uh, assuming you have, let's say, an annual revenue per plumbing client of $10,000, you can easily be over a $10 million agency targeting plumbers alone. So there's there's a lot of opportunity out there for sure. 100%, awesome. Mm -hmm. Guys, if you have questions, post them in the chat. This is live, yes. so you have the opportunity. We will do our best to answer your questions. I wanna get into outbound. And I, I really think this mm. is something you're world-class at and what kind of the main topic Thank I you. wanna focus on. You know, why, why outbound versus mm. inbound in your mind? Sure. Well, I think every agency needs to start with inbound, it has to have a good thought leadership, content marketing. Uh, today, people are doing podcasts and newsletters. All those things are, are, I think, blocking and tackling. You need to have those things. However, when you are, growing and you have that you have that inbound machine going outbound is really the next logical thing to build and the reason why is because you can only influence so much of the market with with inbound as they say i believe only five percent of the market is coming inbound is shopping for a new agency every quarter and that five percent let's say you're targeting plumbers in this example five percent of plumbers in the u.s are looking for a new agency every quarter well those those 5% are going to be shopping a lot of different agencies. So there's no real way for you to control sort of the flow of those opportunities in your direction beyond just doing, again, the blocking and tackling. So the other benefit of doing outbound is if you like a specific type of client, like my, my sales coach and mentor, Rory Clark, talks about, like, if you like donuts, uh, you you can go out and find all the donuts in the market by doing outbound. You can be very sort of targeted and spear and you use spear fishing, that sort of metaphor. Whereas with inbounds, yeah, you may get some donuts, you also get some cookies, maybe some candy and maybe some fruit as well. You're kind of collecting whatever comes in. And so it's much more of a focused uh, effort and you can control the type of uh, businesses that you are going outbound to. The challenge with outbound is that it is expensive and it can result in you know very little return. Many agencies try it, whether it's you know hiring an SDR team or working with a you know a lead gen sort of outbound you know consultant doing LinkedIn and whatnot. And at best, in most cases, these agencies only get uh, you know low quality low quality leads. You know those. Those, uh, those leads that you get on the call with and you realize that, hey, there's no way this, this person is going to be able to spend money with us or they're not the right fit. And so the thing that we learned at Scorpion and uh, I talk about with my clients now is taking a different approach, which is something I call gift-based outbound. Mm. And gift-based outbound was born out of this time at Scorpion where we had this inbound sales team and we wanted to start getting them to get on the call, get on the phones and start going outbound. And of course, if anyone's ever tried to bring outbound sales, cold calling into a sales floor, you, what you realize is that there's gonna be a lot of resistance on the sales floor to pick up the phone. And so one of the ways that we help to um, disarm that, that um, the, the friction there with the sales team and asking them to do cold calls was that we would send a gift ahead of time, ahead of them calling, right? And that was sort of the very beginning of this idea of gift-based outbound. And what it ended up evolving into is a very, uh, very well-oiled machine where we had, uh, at the end of the day, sales, sales reps who would have a, a list of about 200 to 300 uh, uh, accounts they were targeting. And that every quarter, me and the marketing team, me and my team of 30 people, we would send them a gift every quarter until they became a client, 
right? And that was across, you know, many, many salespeople, like 50 to 60 salespeople, every single one of their 200 leads would get a gift every quarter. So it's very coordinated, very, you know, complex. Uh, however, it doesn't need to start there. Um, I'll, I'll pause for, for questions because there's more there. <laughs> no, I, th I, think, I think that's awesome, right? Kind of like recognizing inbound is awesome and you need to have great content out there and you need to yeah. be at the events and you need clients to lean in and kind of enter your world. But if you want to control your destiny and choose the right clients and be able mm -hmm. to call your own shots, eventually you're going to have to build a list of targeted prospects and go after them yes. and get their attention. What worked for you guys was kind of, you're calling a gift. I've always heard it as the Dream 100 initiative, right? Where you tip. Yep. You pick these top prospects, you're going to mm. mail stuff to them. And what you found yeah. was it re reduced the friction for that inbound sales team to be like, hey, all right, at least we mailed them this nice gift <laughs> and I can call behind that and have a right. warm conversation. Correct. Um, and and that, that worked, obviously, because you guys had this, yeah. this you know, accelerated growth. Yeah. And it, like I said, it, it helped us to ultimately double our revenue because we were not only dependent on the inbounds. So that we, we generated this, <clears throat> we generated this growth based on um, this outbound approach. The first thing that I talk about when, when talking about how to, how to adopt this type of strategy is that you really need to focus on the list. The list is the strategy. You talked about the Dream 100, where people get this idea of gifting wrong is that they may just take a traditional outbound approach, which is more of kind of like a, a net phishing, right? A, you, know, you take a large list and you you, you send them emails and you kind of see what comes back. This is very much a spear phishing approach where you have a small list, you qualify the list up front. Uh, and once you have that list, you're right. So it is a process of sending them a gift, uh, uh, not just any gift, by the way, not just like kind of cheap pens, like logo wear. It has to be very intentional. There's some strategy on that. And you have to be prepared to send them a gift for, you know, three years. Uh, and once every quarter. <laughs> powerful, powerful stuff. And, and I hope yeah. didn't get, it didn't get lost. What he said, 90% of you listening, when you're doing your outreach, you're trying to play the easy game, buy a big yeah. list, send a bunch of spammy emails, and you wonder why it's not working. Like you'd much better serve to choose 50 or 100 yes. or whatever the number is and commit and make sure they're good quality. Like these are the, the companies that are whales that you're like, I definitely know I can help them. I yeah. definitely know they've got the money. I definitely mm -hmm. know if I get their attention, they'd probably be interested and probably be a good fit. Have that small group that you go after yes. in, a, in a relentless way. Yeah, it, because it is an incremental effort in incremental cost. Like these, you know, we would send them cookies the bigger, and then- The bigger the list. You know, the, yeah, the, the, the bigger the list and and it gets, you know, you have to factor things like, you know, cash flow and cost into the cost per acquisition. If you're attracting, uh, if you have a poorly created list, you're going to attract leads that you're never going to close. So right. to your point, the work is, the work in list building is typically done at the sales team level where you go out and you quickly buy a list and you send a bunch of emails and whatever comes in, the sales team is kind of filtering out. What I recommend is you do the filtering at the list building level and you only focus on those businesses that, like you said, it's the whales, the dream 100. You as the founder need to go through that list and look at every single one of those leads and say, yes, if I can get this, we can get this person on the phone. We have a better than 50% better than chance of closing them. And we know that we could help them. They would be a great lifetime client. That's the type of business that you want on this gift-based outbound lead list. So good. So be really strategic with the selection mm. of the list and don't just do email, you know, mail. No. You still use email. You still use social yes. messenger. You hit them from every channel possible yes. and you pick up the phone as well. Uh, just those reach outs are a lot easier when you're you're saying, hey, I'm following up because we sent you this cool gift. A uh, couple questions in here um, are asking, mm -hmm. like, what kind of stuff do you send? Like, you know, yeah. home services is an example. You know, half the battle is figuring out, like, what will we spend? How do we source that? How do we get it into their, into yeah. their hands? <laughs> Well, the thing that was tried and true for us, and I'll use a I'll use a uh, an example from the attorney uh, world because I, I you know I have I have a lot of great stories there. We we have great stories in the plumbing world as well. But where we found early days is that when we asked our sales team to call into attorneys, they would have these attorneys would have these gatekeepers, the people at the front desk whose primary responsibility was making sure that people from Scorpion were not actually getting access to the attorney, right? That was, that was the big deal, right? And so, because of course the attorney had to be in court and so on and so forth. So what we did is 
after doing that unsuccessfully for a while, what we what we started doing was sending these gifts. And what we sent was a tin of amazing gourmet cookies. Mm. It would go to the uh, go to the lead attorney. It would be sent in a FedEx box. FedEx typically skips the mailroom, goes right to the attorney's desk. They would open up this beautiful this box and then and, and see these beautiful cookies, like you know, outstanding gourmet cookies that would always end up in the break room. And then, of course. The office is enjoying these cookies. Everyone's saying, like, who brought these amazing cookies? And of course, the, the word scorpion was buzzing all around the office. And the next time, by the time the salesperson calls, the the receptionist or the uh, the gatekeeper go, you know, the energy goes from, you know, very resistant to, oh, you're the ones who send the cookies. Hold on, let me put you through, right? Just changes the whole dynamic. Uh, so cookies are good. Uh, I, I like them. Uh, we've done things like, um, uh, alcohol to to certain to certain types of businesses. We have done video brochures in home services. <clears throat> One of the things that we did pre pre pandemic was we would send uh, a whole bunch of uh, plumbers and HVAC HVAC businesses uh, coffee and donuts from a local um, bakery mm. that would just show up randomly uh, from us uh, and. Gosh, so we did we did a lot of different things along those lines. I could share with you one one thing we did during COVID, which I thought was really interesting. Um, you know, at the time during COVID, as we many of us remember, it was a time of uncertainty, and every business was sort of, you know, really concerned about well, what does this mean for my business, the industry, you know, the future, and so on and so forth. And instead of sending sort of a, an edible gift or something along those lines, what we ended up sending was a COVID care package. Mm. <laughs> and what that was, was a video box, which is literally a box that you open it up and there's a video screen there. And on that video screen, we'd recorded a 20 minute sort of guide to home service businesses and what to do with your business as it relates to internet marketing during COVID. So you would open up this box, you have this great training, in the box was a book written by someone in the trades, um, a, a thought leader in the trades about leading through change. We also included um, uh, some N95 masks and some gloves and some other things. And so the idea here is that we were we were reaching out into this community and uh, with with care and empathy and saying, hey, you know, we understand what you're going through. Let us help you to let us help guide you through this challenging time. Here's some great resources. And we're here if you ever want to talk. Love it. Uh, and I appreciate the specific examples, right? Like be mm. thoughtful with the gift, right? If you send a, a, a logoed mug, that's not going to have nearly <laughs> the same impact as something they can actually consume, something that would have conversation around the office. Yeah. Um, and be willing to spend a little bit. Can you give an idea kind of how much was a typical budget sure. for one of these quarterly gifts? Sure. So I would say... Um, Typically, it was anywhere from between thirty dollars and a hundred dollars, and kind of the the, the math that you should um, be comfortable with is that you need to send a hundred gifts to get three meetings and one sale. Mm, massive, amazing that you, you have those metrics. You're willing to share those metrics. So, yeah, hundred gifts, three meetings, one sale. Um, expectation for your sales team mm. isn't that you know, the client's going to call in and say, Hey, I got your cookies. How do we hire your service? Right. Obviously there's a Correct. follow up. The follow -up. Can you talk a little bit about the bridge conversation? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And and I'll give an example of, of why this is so important over the holidays. We just had the holidays. I sent my clients uh, a, a box of these amazing gourmet cookies and not all of them acknowledged it, uh, you know, because they are busy. Right. And the, and, and the challenge of course, is anytime you, you one of your prospects receives a gift, they're going to have this amazing moment that you've created as a result of this thoughtful, uh, unique gift. But then, of course, what happens is their cell phone rings or their clients call and they're on to the next thing. And so you've kind of missed that moment unless you find a way to capture it. And so what I call it is it's a it's a six step process to follow up on gifts the day they arrive. So it's it is. That you you have to do some coordination logistics with the shipping, but you once you once you know that the gift has arrived, you need to call that day and follow up. And if you don't get them on the phone, sometimes you will, sometimes you won't. You leave a voicemail and then you follow up with an email. Then you wait a day and then you call again. And if you don't get them on the call, you leave a voicemail and you leave, you send an email. You do that basically a total of six times every other day. You do the follow up. Now after that sixth time you're probably 
over that sort of that honeymoon period that you've created with the gift. They've moved on and they're probably ghosting you, right? They're not going to be responsive until you send them the gift the next quarter, right? The other thing I think you said, which is really insightful, is that because this is your dream 100, these are your high quality, uh, high quality uh, leads, it's likely that you're also seeing them at conferences, or maybe you're inviting them as a guest on your podcast, or maybe you're sending them other high quality content along the way in between the gift sends. So that it's not just about the gift, but it's also about um, taking a multi-channel sort of multiple touch point approach to these prospects. Love it. I think something powerful you said there was, you know, we all know about speed to lead, right? Lead comes in. If you don't follow up in five minutes or less, it's going somewhere else, right? And you got to follow up again and again. Yeah. You want to apply this same principle to when the gift gets delivered, right? So if you're doing this, maybe as a smaller agency, you're personally sending these gifts and calling. Yes. You got to carve the time out to know like this is when it's going to drop and this is when I'm reaching out and or train your sales team that like there's a, there's a, an expiration date on how effective this is going to be if you don't follow up and follow through assertively. Absolutely. And I also recommend to not over-engineer this. I would say start with a small list of 20. You as the founder, maybe you do the first round, couple rounds of, of gift sending and the follow-up. Begin to pro, you know, build some process and some systems around it. And then you can really help to extend that to maybe some sales resources who could you know take over some of this follow-up for you. Yeah, so, so good. Can you talk a little bit about how mm -hmm. that call goes? Because I think some people might get hung up. And if you just call in yeah. and say, hey, I sent you cookies. Did you get them? You know, that yeah. may not fly. Uh, so let's talk, yeah. let's talk a little bit about that. So the spirit behind this is not a quid pro quo. In other words, I'm not sending you a gift card so that I can you know pitch you on my, on my wares. It is very much a gesture of, hey, I genuinely want to build a relationship with you. I'm here to add value to your world. And I care about building that that genuine relationship. So the way that the outbound uh, call goes is more of along the lines of, yeah, you know, hey, I sent you a gift. Want to make sure you got it. The reason why I'm calling is because I know about your business, and I know that you know this. These are the things you do, and we believe that we may be able to help you. It may not be right now, maybe sometime down the road. But I but I wanted to introduce myself as someone who is you know. Uh, specialist in your world and wanted to build the relationship. So whenever you're ready, I'm here. Love it. I, I think it's really important. Everybody understand the, the, the intention mm -hmm. on that call, the intention, like you said, is to create that relationship. If it's an Correct. opportunity now, great. If it's not, that's okay. Um, but either you or your sales team think about what you'll say on that call when they answer, what you'll leave yeah. in the voicemail, what you would say in the personal message on LinkedIn or Facebook uh, to kind of lubricate that gift to appointment, you know, process. Correct. And, 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 you know, going back to the metrics, a hundred gifts equal three meetings and one sale. Um, you're not going to get a, a bunch of meetings necessarily out of sending one gift. There is, mm -hmm a compounding effect. It's kind of like interest in the bank where you send the same prospect, a high quality prospect, a gift quarter after quarter after quarter. There's this, uh, you know, the Robert Cialdini's six, six, weapon, six weapons of influence, you know, this idea of reciprocity. If they're truly good gifts, like if they are unique and interesting and they're, they're surprising and um, they, leave, they leave a positive impression, they're, they're going to at some point get on a call with you. Right. And so, you know, that if you have a large enough pool of, of prospects, you're doing this to over time, you know, let's say a three year period is what I talk about. You're going to get on a call with pretty much every one of them. So, so good. Yeah. And really the, <laughs> the objective is for these people to go from, they don't know you to, you know, they feel like they might've gotten something from you to, right. and it feels like these people are constantly, you know, in communication right. with me in a professional way to, I might as well give them the opportunity to see what they could do for me. Correct. It's literally just taking a cold call to a warm call. That's really the, the, the primary value of doing this. So good. There was a question here from uh, Rhino Marketers and they're saying, hey, you know, I've published this book um, and I, I mail that out sometimes. Do you feel like that would fit into the mix of gifts or do you feel that's inappropriate? Mm. Just I, lo I love sending out books um, because it really helps to position you as a thought leader. We've done that a lot where we would create like coffee, coffee style books that were really beautifully designed. Um, and the, the cool thing about books is that they typically end up on the bookshelf, right? Mm -hmm. So you have this, 
this longevity of this asset that you sent out, they may not read it. Chances are they probably won't read it, but they may put it on their bookshelf. And that's a really good thing. So I, I highly recommend doing that. So theoretically, you could mail your book. You could mail cookies. Mm -hmm. You could mail right. someone else's book. You could mail an Correct. interesting care package. You got to get creative. But the goal would be mm -hmm. to quarterly be dropping this and not just dropping Correct. gifts and hoping, but dropping these gifts and proactively reaching right. out and making correct. these connections. That's that's absolutely correct. And I also love the idea of sending someone else's book because um, that is a great way to borrow some of their credibility, that author's mm -hmm. credibility by sending it to them. So it's a really high high quality touch point. Love it, love it. So good. So let, let's talk a little bit about building this team, right? Because mm -hmm. ideally as you go to multiple seven figures and eight figures and yes. beyond, you don't want to be the person following up. You want to build a, a world-class sales team, which yeah. obviously you said you guys grew it from 10 guys to, uh, did you say 100 salespeople at, at the uh, kind of- It was a 100-person sales organization, which included yeah. sales enablement and you right. know some of these things. But it was, it was probably a, a, to the scale of like 70 salespeople. <laughs> wow. So can, can you talk a little bit about some of the, you know, the yeah. strategies you guys employed to attract great salespeople that were willing to make yeah. these calls and kind of- could, could could carry the opportunities across the finish line? Absolutely. So the there's there's a couple of different things that, that I think are important here. The the first one is going way back to when I just started at the at the agency, there was the six person sales team. We brought in outbound. Uh, it took a while for that core group of of sellers to really embrace the idea of outbound again because they had so much success. So part of the ways that we um, we built that was to hire new salespeople and we would train them in the new way of selling, right? So that became part of the standard. One of the things that um, I find is true and it's based on my experience and I just know generally is that salespeople are typically a little bit competitive, mm -hmm. right? And so one of the ways that we would help to encourage people to do things like go outbound is by bringing in a really great salesperson who could help to Sort of set the new standard, and so that was that was an important piece of hiring really great, high quality um, salespeople who knew how to run the play. That's number one. Number two is we really had to not only depend on sort of the tried and true salespeople who knew how to do those uh, close those those bigger deals and 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 run the play. We also had to find a way to train up new salespeople, and the best way that we found to do that was by bringing in more sales management layers. You couldn't have the, the sort of the head of sales, the VP of sales, trying to coach the out, outbound cold caller, you know, or the you know the closer. You really had to bring in those layers of uh, of of management. So that was really important for us. I also think something that was really important for us was when we started leaning into the home services vertical and the franchise vertical. Um, we built an incremental sales team. We weren't asking the legal sellers to all of a sudden start selling to plumbers. What we had to hire new people, in addition to Travis, as I mentioned earlier, new people who were exclusively focused on building their book of business within home services. So I think the, the lesson, and we did the same in, in franchise, and I think the lesson there is the benefit you get out of having a vertical specialist salesperson i.e. they have the relationships in the vertical, they have the experience, they know the case studies, they go to the conferences, all of those things far outweigh the cost of an incremental salesperson, right? So taking that approach, that truly verticalized uh, sales team approach, many agencies won't do that, I think, because they're trying to find scale. But, mm -hmm. but in my experience, that's a great, uh, a great way to build out the sales team. Got I think a great, great insight there is just recognizing you know, the, 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 you know, the phrase, it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks applies in this scenario, right? And if your <laughs> team has been trained, that leads come in and they're closers and they're going to take them to the sales process and ask for the business. And that's mm. worked for them for years and years. And you're trying to shift gears and say, hey, now I need you to start to hunt a little bit. I need you to follow yeah. up on these gifts and set these appointments. That's going to be an uphill battle. You probably better serve to, you know, hire a new team. If I understand what you're saying, that can focus yeah. on doing that. And then as they set the pace, then show the other guys, hey, look, you know, this individual is getting all these deals that he created on his own, not from- Correct, Cor correct. And so, um, you know, when when management says you need to do certain things, um, uh, it's, it's a little bit of influence, but when you have 
a sales per a new salesperson on the sales floor being very successful running the new play that's a different sort of quality of influence that the uh, the sales team uh, will definitely pay attention to love that I, I I'm sure you can't talk specifics but can you talk a little mm -hmm. bit about um you know how you how you structure a compensation plan for this type yeah. of sales role sure so you have to give exact numbers but just yeah 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 so the 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 sellers at Scorpion, I'm not sure exactly what they're doing today, but um, during my time there, we had seller, we went through a period where we were, we brought in SDRs, which were sort of the people who were doing the initial outreach for the gifts, appointment setters. We ultimately did away with that. We had the salespeople be sort of a full, full stack uh, salesperson. They would do the outbound as well as doing the closing. The compensation was based on a 50 50 model. So they're, um, they would have an expected quota that they were that they were assigned that they would ramp over time and that quota would would result in commissions and so we had this concept of an on target earnings so um, if if the salesperson is successful that they should make let's say $100,000 out of that $100,000 50% of that is salary and 50% of that is performance that's the 50/50 so we take what we expect from them a total output and then we give them half of that in salary the other half is in performance and of course, in sales, you don't have a, a cap on the amount of sort of commissions you make. But when when you're meeting expectations, that's where we would take the what we call the on target earnings. Excellent. Can, can you talk a, a little bit about um, kind of any pre selection strategy that you guys might have used in terms of you know you're, you're you're putting out ads to attract salespeople and you've got mm. these people coming in? How you identified okay this looks like a great fit versus this one we're going to pass on? I think the thing I'd, I'd like to share in this regard is we wanted people who were eager, obviously, um, were driven, but also who were impressionable, right? Mm. Who were willing to adopt our approach to selling. Now, when you came in as a salesperson at Scorpion, there was a whole two week sales um, incubation. There was a lot of support and we gave you a lot of tools. However, the sales folks who didn't adopt those or wanted to use the old way were not really successful. And so we were really screening for was people who were willing to trust us, trust our process and lean into it because we believed over time that that was going to help them to be successful. So that coachability trait is the main thing you guys were looking Correct. for. Are they willing Correct. to take this and say, okay, I'm going to change versus I've sold this way for a decade and you know, this is just how I'm going to do it. If you don't like it, right. you know, it's what it right. is. Right. We, we, as the agency had to control the process because we had the reps, we had meaning the, the amount of experience that we did and we understood what success looked like. And we, if we had given that control over to, let's say a salesperson who didn't understand those things, we'd be putting our success at jeopardy. Love it. Love it. Great stuff mm. for, you know, for the, for the agency that let's say that's, you know, a million dollars per year. And yeah. right now they've got one salesperson or maybe they're just selling themselves. Um, mm. What are your suggestions on making the leap from having a salesperson to actually building a sales team? Yeah. So the there's a couple ways to approach it. I think um, if you are a if you are a founder of an agency, as you said, doing a million dollars and you're primarily doing sales, the, the, the natural progression is to bring someone up who's already in the business, who understands the customers, who understands your product and bring them up into more of a sales role. There's obviously some coaching and some aptitude and they have to be interested. Um, another way to grow is if you are a vertical, vertically focused agency, you know, a quick way to kind of shortcut your, your learning and your, uh, your ability to get a, a salesperson up to speed is to find someone, a salesperson, who has already been selling into that market. Mm. The benefit there is that they already understand the market itself. They have probably have relationships with other, uh, other businesses that uh, you want to attract. Um, and they can probably get to work pretty easily. Love it. So kind of looking for someone that's already been selling into that industry that you yeah. can bring right in. Um, and then kind of shifting from just a one person salesperson to actually deciding you know, I yeah. think the agencies that go to eight figures and multiple eight yeah. figures shift yeah. from having a salesperson to having a true sales team. Yes. And so the, the way the way that you could do that is 
uh, primarily you'll have, if you have a single salesperson who is really, really strong, um, they typically don't need a lot of oversight, but the minute you want to bring in new sort of fresh blood is when you want to start, in my opinion, you want to start, uh, finding a sales director, someone who could, um, build a sales training program and be responsible for bringing up more junior sales people. Uh, that's really the right time to bring in that, that sales management in my experience. Got it. So kind of building that infrastructure around building the team. I think where a lot of agencies get stuck here is hmm. um, they've got the salesperson that's like an inbound closer. They've got enough deal flow for that person and hmm. to create enough deal flow for a whole nother salesperson where it doesn't eat into that person's income becomes a, a like a chasm they have to, to get over. Um, right. Do you feel like the outbound engine there is kind of the, the critical aspect to be able to say, hey, look, we're going to bring this salesperson in. They're going to follow up on these opportunities and they have to create most of those opportunities as they go, yeah. which then gives you the unlimited potential to bring on more and more salespeople and get them up to speed. I certainly think if you could figure out how to get outbound to work on a consistent basis, that is that is the key to growth in my experience. Because again, you control that. Um, yeah, so I think you, you, you need to, um, in, in many cases, I, I, the, based on my experience, a lot of agencies will have a lot of inbound flow. However, they're probably not taking the most advantage of those inbounds, are right? Because they, they have maybe- back? Are they following right. up quickly, right? Exactly. So that would really be the primary focus is bringing another resource, maximize all the inbound opportunity that you can. At that point, you would bring in some someone else to focus on outbound. Now, in practicality, you want to give even the outbound folks some inbounds, right? You want to give, give them, them a couple of the, 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 yeah. the easy wins, right? Just so they're not- <laughs> right. Right. So they're, so they're not struggling on the side, just trying to figure out how to, how to get the outbound working. So good. Lots of, lots of great insights here. Corey, thanks so mm. much for sharing and kind of like mm. getting into specific details. Uh, yeah. we've, got, we've got 50 or so live. So if you guys have questions, post them Please. in. We've still got a few more minutes for any questions you guys might have burning. Um, mm. I want to talk a little bit about industry events and conferences, because one thing yes. I noticed as an observer in the same vertical um, you mm. know, we were at these trade shows and events in the home services space, plumbing and HVAC yeah. specific. Mm. And we usually get the 10 by 10 booth and we kind of do our thing. And we saw Scorpion come in, you know, and, and take over the entire convention. Uh, talk to me a little bit about the strategy behind that. Yeah. And, you know, how big do you go without, you know, going too big? <laughs> we did kind of go big. Um, <laughs> so what <laughs> the, the strategy behind the conferences is that, when you go to a conference, the people that you otherwise are trying to approach from a cold call or a LinkedIn or even a gift based, you know, you know, phone based conversation, whatever that is, there are natural kind of barriers to building a relationship. However, when you are in person, that is an amazing opportunity to really build a genuine relationship, right? They could look at you eye to eye. And I know that, you know, industries like home services, they just like doing business sort of belly to belly, right? <laughs> Meaning they want to look you in the eye. They want to get a sense for you, whether or not you're a slick salesperson who's going to sell them a bunch of, you know, uh, stuff that isn't real, or if you are a genuinely good person. And so the way that we approached uh, events and conferences at Scorpion was based a little bit on a, on a book called The Experience Economy. And there's a, there's a great quote in there. I'm going to butcher it, but it's about if you didn't create a memory, it wasn't, eco it wasn't an economically you know, viable experience. Mm. So what we wanted to do when we had this opportunity, all the people we're trying to sell to in the same place that we're going to be in the same physical location, how do we create an experience that results in a memory that they can carry forward after the conference? Right. We've all been to those conferences where we're walking in the exhibit hall and we're going from booth to booth. And it's just kind of a big wash of just stuff. Right. So what yeah. we wanted to do is we wanted to stand out. We wanted to be different. And so one of the things that we would do is, I think, uh, for a couple of years, we gave away a car on the uh, on the show floor. <laughs> yeah. And uh, which was different because people weren't doing it back, oh, yeah. back then at the time. And so the purpose of that was obviously come to our booth, give us, let us scan your badge. And then you may, at the end of this conference, may you may walk away with keys to this car specifically, right? So it was a different kind of experience. It created a memory. The way we gave away the car was pretty interesting where uh, you had to physically be present and then we would literally pull a name out of a hat. So it's still a really great sort of moment for people. 
we would also do things off campus, meaning if we were in Vegas, we would go to uh, you know a Britney Spears concert. We'd buy out the front uh, the front row of Britney Spears concert and and now have that experience. We'd go drive exotic cars. However, you know we were a bigger agency. Not every agency probably can do that. What's important is how do you create a memorable experience with them? It could be going to breakfast with your prospects. It could be um, having a wonderful meal, bringing in a thought leader or an author to an intimate dinner. You know what? You know these type of things. Uh, really do make a lasting impression. For us, it was a key part of our growth. Yeah, I think I, I absolutely made an impact even for your competitors, just seeing it and, and like, <laughs> and like yeah. you went all in. And if you've got the financial resources as, a, as an agency to do that, go for mm -hmm. it, right? But yeah. the key takeaway here, guys, is be sure you plug into these industry events and conferences, right? Something powerful happens live and in person and, and try and stand out. Right. Even if you can only afford the 10 by 10, you can do something yeah. creative with the booth. You can, you know, schedule a dinner. Um, don't just show up and stand at the booth and hope people walk up to you. Be assertive with it. Yeah, I would I would add to that one other point, which I think could be helpful, is that the first time you go to an industry conference, you're really not going to know a whole lot of people. Mm. And that's OK. Right. You want to be president. You want to build relationships. But the next year you go, your people are going to recognize you and you'll be like, oh, yeah, I remember you from last year. Da, da, da. By the third time you go, the third year, you've you know, it's like seeing an old lost friend. Right. Because you are continually building those experiences and creating those memories. And that's when um, you really begin to build the trust and the recognition in the industry. Yeah. And, and like you said, it's a, it's a compounding effect. Uh, mm. You know, the more you go, the more you get known the better right. the relationships, the opportunities to present on stage and things like that start to open up. So don't Correct. think of it as a one hit wonder, just like with the, <laughs> with the, with the gifting strategy, don't mail one gift to, to your entire database and expect that to be, um, mm. this, this takes persistence. It takes time. Yeah. Um, do, do you find that the combination of the thought leadership, the outbound, the being at the events and conferences have a synergistic outcome? Like they start to play off each other and get, better results than if you just did one or the other a thousand percent uh yes a hundred percent josh uh, it is it is a combination of these touch points we would get feedback that you know gosh you guys at scorpion are, you guys are kind of everywhere you're at the conferences you're at the associations we can we, you know we've been a guest on your podcast you you retarget us on the web like you're really kind of everywhere and the the impact we were trying to create was we know that as a business let's say a plumber that um, you know is in this city, does these types of things, we know that you'd be a great client for us. And, and more importantly, we know that we could help you in a very meaningful way. And so, yeah, we're being intentional about making sure that we're in front of you so that when you become ready to make a buying decision, that you include us on that short list of agencies that you're, that you're reaching out to. Love it. So, so good. A couple of questions here about compensation. And if you can't speak to it, it's fine. Yeah. Uh, Justin's asking about: Are you paying on a one-time or on a re, you know re recurring for for sales? Yeah, Justin. So the way that we did it, uh, it again evolved over time, but generally the the process was that a salesperson would make. So we had three fees at Scorpion: we had a setup fee, a monthly fee, and then a, a percent spend. Which so we'd make money on the on the on the Google Ad spend. Um, they would make a percentage of the setup fee which obviously incentivized them to keep the setup fee in, in, the, uh, in the deal. Um, and then over time, they would get a, a payout of, of a percentage of the revenue that we collected, not just that we, you know, we build, but we actually collected. They would get a certain percentage of that for the first year, and then it would step down to a, a half of that percentage in the second year. So effectively, every new client gave a scorpion salesperson a, a bump up front with a with you know a percentage of the setup fee and then a recurring two-year recurring uh, income stream for them awesome great great share i appreciate you sharing that my recommendation yeah. typically especially if you're inbound at this point in your agency you pay on the upfront and as little as possible on the recurring right i think mm -hmm. a big mistake some agencies make is like oh go go sell and i'll give you 10 percent of the recurring uh, and that works for 10 clients and then it starts to, you know, it just totally <laughs> kill your margins. Uh, so, yeah. you know, tr you know, pay 20, 25, 30% of the first month and zero or 1% on the residual yeah. for the first year. Yeah. Um, that's going to be much more manageable, at least in the immediate term for most of us. Yep. 
Yeah, and then it does sunset at a certain point. You want to keep these folks motivated to continually, you know, um, you know, get that recurring going. And if it's if it's perpetual, that can uh, cause them to be less motivated. I think. So good. Can you talk a little bit about um, management rich which rules for the sales team? You talked about yeah. kind of you know as you grow, you need someone to manage the closers and you know manage those earlier you know yeah. outbound appointment people. Any any like strategies you can share on on meeting rhythms with the sales team as it grows the, the meeting rhythms yeah um so a daily stand-up is is essential in my perspective and this is an opportunity to get the sales team pumped up and get them focused and talk about committing to what they're going to do again in sales you get your deal with a lot of rejection and so that camaraderie typically if it's in person it's great it doesn't have to be but that opportunity for people to really feel connected and part of a, a greater thing as well as be held accountable um you know i i believe that the best performers you know executives salespeople, whatever they like a scale uh, they like a sale uh a scoreboard excuse me they like to have something where they can be measured against they're motivated by that and so by having a daily stand up, it's an opportunity to, again, for people to show up, be accountable and to commit to what they're going to do that day. So as you build that sales team, don't think it's set and forget it. Okay. You're mm -hmm. hired, go do your job. It's, no. a, it's a tough job, right? So they need to be <laughs> encouraged. They need to have a scoreboard that they can kind of measure themselves again. Exactly. Um, and they need to be coached up, right? You need to be every once in a while role-playing with them and kind of getting feedback. Yeah. Yeah. And there's some great tools for the feedback piece. I think that uh, the challenge, of course, is that a lot of people use these tools like Gong and whatnot to record these calls. However, they forget to actually go and review the Gong calls. It's being recorded, but no one's doing anything with it, right? <laughs> and so that reinforces the need to have that layer, that management layer of folks who are exclusively responsible for helping to, as you said, level up, support these salespeople and provide them with um, a structure that's going to help them to be successful. You mentioned Gong. This was a question that mm. David asked in, in advance that he wanted to make sure I brought up. Yeah. Are, are there any other tools that you find you know help you know with building the sales team, managing the sales team, managing the outbound process? Yeah. So tools are interesting when it comes to salespeople because they're not particularly. I'll, I'll speak very generally. They're not particularly great at admin. You know and. Uh, having you know, managed a large sales and marketing group, having great data is actually really, really important. And so what you want to do is you want to try as hard as possible as a man from the management perspective or the leadership perspective to depend on them to, you know, for things like uh, data, data uh, input and whatnot, like for instance, logging calls and so on and so forth. You try and minimize that as much as possible because if you expect them to do a lot, then either they'll spend half their day trying to figure out how to do the admin, <laughs> yep. um, which is not their best and highest use, um, or they just won't do it, uh, which is also a problem. And so um, when it comes to the tools specifically, we used um, HubSpot as our sales CRM. It's a great tool, I think, for agencies of, of pretty much any size. I use it myself even now. Um, and so, uh, but but regardless of that sort of sales CRM, I would try and make it, Try and set it up so that it is the least amount of steps and, and overhead for that salesperson at the same time that you as a sort of a leadership can extract the, the value out of that. So the way to do that is through, there's a lot of automations you can build into that. Um, when it comes to building your outbound process, I'm a big believer of just, you know, just starting with Google Sheets or Excel, not over engineering it. You're going to have a list of 20 to 50 businesses that you're going to send gifts to every quarter. There's a six step follow up, just making sure that that is being tracked and you're you're looking at the results and the impact of the, those campaigns. That's the place to start. And then over time, you could bring that into the CRM to help to integrate that with the other systems you have. So good. Yeah, lots of lots of great tools and, and resources mm. there. Um, Corey, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for the great <laughs> insights on building a sales team, on dialing in your outbound. I know you have a new book coming up called Anyone, Not Everyone. Yes. Um, how, can, how can the listeners you know, connect with you, get that book, learn more about you? Thanks, Josh. So we, uh, the book is, as you mentioned, Anyone, Not Everyone. It's a book. It's the five steps to escape founder-led sales. And the, the, the premise of it is that 
you escape founder-led sales by becoming a vertical market specialist. And so in the book, it will be, um, is, is are those five steps. There's a lot of worksheets and videos, the things to support that outside the book. It, it will be available uh, next month. So we're recording this on in February. It'll be available in, later in March. Place to go to sign up to be notified will be, the name of the book is Anyone Not Everyone. The website is anyonenoteveryone.com. You can go there today, sign up, and then I'll notify you when the book comes out. Fantastic. So guys, get this. It's going to be a great book. Anyone, not everyone.com. Um, mm. Enter your name and email address. You'll get, you'll get a pre notification when the book comes live. Um, Corey, how else would you like people to connect with you? They want to learn more. They want to yeah. engage with you. I would say, um, go to my website. You can sign up for my newsletter. I have a daily newsletter. i also have a podcast that, uh, is where I interview agency founders who have taken a vertical market approach. Many of your clients, Josh, have been uh, my my uh, my guests. And so, um, yeah, that's a great way to to hear more of these success stories of these vertically focused agencies. So good. Awesome. Mm. Well, Corey, thanks so much for taking the time today. Um, any last piece of wisdom you would share with that agency owner yeah. that's looking to go to the next level? I, yeah, I you know I think that we probably are similar of mind when I when I when I share this, which is that the the best way in my mind to scale up an agency is by becoming a specialist in a vertical market. I know you preach that, and I'm a big supporter of that idea. And I think that not every agency will start there, but if you want to get the the success that companies like Scorpion and others have have achieved, it's through this vertical specialization. So if this is something you're interested in, I would lean into it. So good. Corey, mm. this has been great. Guys, post your follow-up <laughs> questions. We'll be looking at your questions. Even if you happen to be watching this on the replay, uh, mm. be sure to reach out to Corey and thank him for, for sharing in his abundance mindset coming on and sharing all these insights with us today. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody.